could do uh, here in the class. And those of you that are with us online, we're happy to have you uh, with us tonight. We're going to start out with having Aaron give his five to seven minute talk. And uh, we're looking not at content, but we're looking at time frame, if he fits within the time. Aaron? All right. I want to thank you all for coming tonight. So does anybody know how many different Egyptian gods there are? 30. Anybody else? 45. <laughs> uh, there are a little over 2,000 distinct Egyptian gods all over some different thing. So you have Ra, the sun god. You have Osiris, the god of the afterlife. There's Horus, Anubis, Seth, Ekerik, and Nimu. There's tons. Hinduism and Buddhism have many denominations that believe in multiple gods, but we're different. We only believe in the one God. But we want to know what is our God over? Because all the gods are diff over different things. What's our God over? There are several examples from the Bible of God having power over certain things. So firstly, with the physical world, we see in Joshua 10, 12 through 13, we see an example of God controlling the sun. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said to, in the sight of Israel, sun stand over Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. So God has control over the sun, but he also has control over the weather in Mark 4:39 when Jesus calmed the storm. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was great calm. So here we see several things that God has control over in the physical manner. But God also has control over the spiritual world. In Revelations 1.18, God says, I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. God has power over death, and in Matthew eleven twenty five, 25, he says he, has, he is over heaven. At the time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth. In John 6, 40, we have God ruling over the salvation, and this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So we've seen examples of Jesus, of God, being over the physical and the spiritual world. But some ask, what is the most important thing that God is over? And I would argue we can find that answer in 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. God is over love. God is of love. Hey, like I mentioned before, you'll never be criticized for having a little shorter sermon or lesson, uh, but if you have too long a one, you're in trouble. <laughs> Me and my dad can't lie. Sure, yeah, between the two of you, you're just right. Yeah. Doug, you're, you're on the list for tonight, too. If Did, did you have something ready? That's fine. That's fine. We're going to slow down just a little uh, and go back and catch up on a couple things that I skipped over because we were going so fast through. The important thing from lesson number one that you really need to uh, get in your mind, I don't have page numbers on these for which I am sorry, but uh, just a second. Lesson number one, dealing with the points of a sermon outline. Inside your booklet, it should look like this, about the third or fourth set of pages in. 
Top of the page is Roman numeral three. A good sermon outline can be a really good help in preaching. Uh, that list of things, are that, that's uh, in section five, things you need to have a good workable outline. Th those are the key points that if you get nothing else out of the next several weeks of uh, classes, these are, are the key points you need if you're going to have a good sermon that's workable and preachable. And we're going to uh, not pick on Noah tonight when he's preaching <laughs> in case he doesn't have all of these. And remember, we did talk about uh, there's a segue or a, a, a shift going between the introduction into the body of the sermon and then from the body of the sermon back out. You have that transition uh, there, transitional sentence, and we'll, we'll pick up a little bit more on that. Also, on lesson two, we were talking about funeral sermons. Have any of you ever done a funeral, preached a funeral? One, two, three, okay, four. Uh, yeah, it's still part of it, still part of it. Uh, and so never say never for those of you that didn't raise your hands because you never know when you may get called on. Uh, we had one of our elders in Des Moines that he actually did his mother's funeral, which I, I don't know how his nerves took it. But anyway, uh, he... he was able to keep himself under control and do his mother's funeral. Uh, the outline that we gave you in the workbook here is a general outline. As time goes on, try to collect some little poems or prose or a haiku or a loku or whatever that you could, that that will apply. Uh, I for a while I had a a, a whole series of books on, on poetry and uh, they ended up getting ruined when uh, they were in our basement and it got moldy down there and we didn't know it and had to throw them out pages molded on the books but I had pulled several really good poems that fit into funerals from that and so if you're reading something or if you are watching tv or watching whatever and something strikes you as oh that would work in a funeral Write it down or make a note. I think um, you have the, the statement that this is a good general outline if the deceased has family who are members of the church. Yes. Uh, just out of curiosity, what would your approach be if uh, the family was not a member of the church or it's, the deceased himself? It's tough. Yeah. When we lived in uh, Indiana, a fellow down the road from us owned the local tavern and he sold beer to teenagers. They would go out and get killed in car wrecks. Literally dozens of children in our county were dead from car wrecks because of the liquor he sold. But since I happened to be a neighbor of his, uh, about a mile down the road when he died, the family came knocking on my door and said, will you do the funeral for us? And I did. Uh, <laughs> one of the toughest funerals, you, I, I, there was nothing good to say about the guy in the coffin. So what do you do? You try to comfort those that are still alive, the ones that have been left behind. And, and you know, you can't say what you'd like to about the person in the coffin, all right? Uh, although I have had a, uh, someone that took my class that got up at a funeral and said, no matter what we say now, now at the funeral, it's not going to change the outcome of where they spend eternity, uh, which is a true statement. But yeah, all I could do was talk to the family and try to encourage them to do what is right uh, without getting into a lot of negative about the, the guy. Uh, but that, that's tough. That's tough. You know, uh, and again, a lot of families in the community were really upset because they knew he was selling this liquor to the kids out the back door of his tavern. But uh, nobody seemed to stop it. But you're going to run into that. A child's funeral, very, very difficult, especially if it's a church family uh, that's involved. One of the young, one of the younger men that took my class, uh, when we were in Des Moines, there are two or three of the funeral homes that would let us actually go in and, and talk with them about funerals and then show us the caskets and, and do different things uh, with the funeral home. And uh, that was one of my classes, one of the night's uh, classes. 
and uh, had one of the guys that he just couldn't be in the casket room. He'd lost a, a very young child and, and he did fine till he got to the smaller caskets. And he said, I just can't be in here. And he had to leave. So it's very emotional. Don't know if that answers your question or not, but uh, there's enough things you can find just about, you know, <laughs> I had a, a Hell's Angel type guy I, I did a funeral for and I got the, several good licks in, licks in on the judgment to come and hellfire and I mean, <laughs> burn them up a little bit. Uh, I wasn't too worried because the police department, sheriff's department was right across the street from the funeral home and if things got too out of hand, uh, sometime we may talk a little more about that. But yeah, it, there, there are good things you can say, you know, about the, the guy was great for his family. And so you try to find the good points. That's where you talk to the, talk to the family a little bit uh, about, you know, some of the good things he did. Maybe the funeral director uh, knows some things that are on, on a positive light and can be a big help to you. Uh, that's probably more so true in a smaller town, smaller community where everybody knows everybody, you know, 10,000 or less people. But uh, anyway, try to find something good to say, try to keep a positive spin. Phil? Yeah, if I may uh, share one experience. Uh, in St. Louis, we had a neighbor that was Catholic. And uh, they were very close. Uh, they uh, were very good with the kids and everything. And uh, to my surprise, they asked me to uh, preach the funeral. And uh, to also my surprise, they did not have the Catholic priest there. Oh my! Yeah. But what I what I did was pretty much reminisce how he kept the neighborhood kids safe by slowing down cars, sure, and uh, watching them. And uh, even though we had tried to convert it a number of number of times. That was about the only thing that I could think of that I could possibly say to them was his love for the kids in the neighborhood. Sure. And so you try to say something, find find what positive there is. I don't care how bad a person is, there's going to be something positive. He was the best burglar in the area or whatever. But find something positive that you can say uh, about them. Uh, yeah, if we ever get into the practical ministries, we spend a, a whole class on funeral stuff and wedding stuff and other things. Uh, also here in, in lesson two, we jumped over it, but I have a committal service. It's in your book sideways. I apologize for that. I could not, could not make my printer print it vertically. Uh, I don't know what went wrong, and so it ended up printing on a sideways in lesson two, but just because you preach the funeral inside, when you get outside, you, you've got to say something over the casket at the cemetery, uh, and sometimes there's a, uh, they'll have the, the funeral service outside, uh, and so, you know, just, just be prepared for that. But here's a little poem, and I've used it at several funerals over the years that uh, say, say that to the uh, family. Okay, last week on lesson three, we romped through a little bit fast. Uh, Put together a rough sermon outline from these texts. Let's look at 1 Timothy 4. Hopefully some of you did a little of that. 1 Timothy 4, verses 11 through 14. Trying to get into... No, did I ask, answer your question on the... Okay, on the funerals. 1 Timothy 4, 11 through 14. What did any of you, did, well, did any of you get to do that? And if so, what did you write down for? For information on a very general outline, 1 Timothy 4, 11 through 14. Yes. Doug, you got it, something? Okay. You mean just like my outline? Or yeah, just, just kind of read off your outline. I said, first I said teach. Teach your congregation. Second, don't 
Don't look down because of your youth, or don't let other people look down for your youth. Sure. I think maybe both would apply. And set an example in four or five things your own speech, your conduct, your love, your faith or spirituality, and your purity. And the third main point is kind of devote yourself to these three things public scripture reading. Which I think maybe they did more of that than we do. Yes. I mean, I remember that I think it was in the temple where he talks about Jesus. He uh, he, he read from the scrolls and mm -hmm. seems to talk more about reading than, than teaching, but I guess explain it too. And uh, the other two things are preaching and teaching. Preaching and teaching. So the third thing is public scripture, scripture reading, maybe in the church, and preaching and teaching. Good. You had a good outline. Anyone else have something? I don't have anything specific, but I mean, just, just reading uh, verse 11. Yeah. I, I can totally see you if you had a lesson where you were reaching, reading from 1 Timothy 4, and you would run across it, you would say, now this is a good three-point sermon outline, because <laughs> it says teach these things, and then it goes in to say what those things are. Yeah. And then verse 15, which is not included on our outline, but it's, it ends with take pains with these things. And so it's like 11, it's like teach these things. 12, 13, 14 lists what those things are, and then 15 is like because of those things, do this. So it's a good uh, thing to look at, just kind of be like boom, boom, boom. And you're right, that's, how, that's where I get my ideas for sermons sometimes and and sometimes the bible just gives you your main points tucker you had your hand up thank you noah so the one on 2 timothy 6 17 through 19 i have my six positive and two negatives how many positive six you got the six okay what were, what did you have on those that's okay, first timothy six Very good. You got everything down that I've got and one besides. So you, you're good on that. So in the in what he's done there in uh, 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, I gave you a little hint. There, there are at least six positive and two negative things in there. Here's what we should do. Here's some things we shouldn't be doing. And again, uh, my way of outlining isn't the only way, but it's one way of outlining, and if you can find a way that does work for you, that's good. Uh, we're not trying to rubber stamp you, make you into Art Wallace robots <laughs> by any means. Be your own individual selves on this, but find a way to make a logical outline from the scriptures uh, without doing violation to the scriptures. You guys are good. All right. Next page. We're actually we may actually get into uh, lesson four, which we were going to do tonight. <laughs> Next page is John three sixteen. What would be a good title for this, Tanner? Love of God. Love of God. Okay. Anybody else? One of the earlier classes I had uh, had God's greatest gift as the title, God's Greatest Gift. But the love of God is included in that tenor. Good idea. Uh, scripture reference would be John 3, 16. Proposition. Again, we're going back to lesson one to that list of things that you need to have in a sermon outline. Proposition. So Tanner, if, if you could call it uh, dealing with the love of God, what did you have for proposition or did you have? Did you put anything in there? Okay. Just teaching. I mean, the proposition is like, what are you hoping to 
tell them. Yes. And so just maybe, maybe not exactly like what, what the love of God is, because I think that's, that can be a very um, huge topic. It can sure. Be very, very, um, like a big thing to cover, especially on like the first or first, first few sermons. What I, what I like to do is instead of talking about the topic itself and like in depth, is giving examples of what God's love. Sure. Be. This is why the, the class I had years ago went with God's greatest gift because you can have a proposition of Jesus is God's greatest gift. And so then you, you've got a goal you're, you're aiming for. How do you broaden that out into uh, other areas? Uh, introduction on that, the, the class I, I taught earlier talked about birthday gifts or holiday gifts. You know, everybody likes getting gifts. You ever not like to get a gift? I'm just sure when you got your car, you got, well, I just don't really want that, Dad. You know, <laughs> everybody likes a gift. You know, nobody rejects their Christmas present or their birthday gift. Everybody likes to get a So you use that as the introduction. And remember, we said earlier in one of the earlier classes here, if you don't get their attention within the first 30 seconds, you're going to have a tough time getting their attention. So you talk about gifts, talk about something the people in the crowd uh, listening to you understand or, or, or can relate to. And so then uh, dealing with the, uh, the, the main points of the body, the, the fact that God is the greatest giver for God to love the world. Uh, he so loved, that's the greatest love. The world is the greatest recipient uh, that he gave. Again, the idea of he's a, a giver, his only begotten son, the world's greatest gift. And, and you just break, let the, let the scripture itself be the main points of your outline. Again, that's just one way to cover it. But uh, we're just trying to cover the basics here. That's why this class is called Basic Preaching. Uh, cover some of the, the very basics on that and then uh, have a transitional sentence and wrap it up. Remember in your introduction, you're supposed to kind of tell them what you're going to tell them, what you're going to talk about in the body of the sermon, you tell them. In the conclusion, you tell them what you told them. You wrap it up and uh, hopefully it'll work. Thoughts or comments on that? Okay, the script or the uh, sermon that is in the, your booklet on that is Choices. Uh, and it was from Genesis 39, 7 through 12. Again, I, I've broken it down according to the par various parts in lesson one, uh, the Bible reading there. If you have a title, it helps guide you into your proposition, which guides you into your introduction. Oh, by the way, introduction and conclusion should both be able to be written before you write the body of the sermon. And the reason for that is, you may go, what do you mean? Conclusion before you write the sermon? Yes, you want to know where you want to end up. And if you've got the conclusion written ahead of time, you know where you're going. Otherwise, you're liable to chase rabbits. Get sidetracked on this or that. But if you've got your conclusion already written if not written down, at least in your mind, know where you want to end up and how you want it to end up. Again, it, it ties in with the proposition of where are you going? <laughs> but if you write your conclusion and your introduction first, then you've got a framework that the body of the sermon fits in, or it should. Introduction here, well, uh, proposition or theme. We have freedom to make choices, but with each choice comes the end result of each choice. So we need to make our choices wide, wisely. Introduction, ever since man was placed in the Garden of Eden, man has been given the freedom of choice. Although I had, uh, I read an article this last week. A guy says, we, have, we are not free moral agents. And I read his little article and I thought, he chose whether or not he wrote 
the article. We are free moral agents. The fact he put that out proved what he was trying to disprove. We have the freedom of choice. He chose to write that article. Uh, anyway, for what it's worth, department, uh, my brain works weird sometimes, and I catch things like that. Anyway, ever since man was in the Garden of Eden, it's had freedom of choice. We get to choose, and then we live with the consequences of our choice. Every choice we make, no matter how big or how small it is, affects not only us, but others around us. That's just the way God made the world. Uh, when God made us in his image, his, after his likeness, he put within us the ability to make choices. We need it in our daily lives. When the sun comes up and the alarm goes off, we choose whether or not we get up immediately or want to snooze for another five or ten minutes. And then after rush around a while, either get the kids ready for school or us off to work. But the choice is ours. We even have the privilege of choosing whether or not to pay our taxes. But if you don't pay your taxes, the rest of us will do our Christian duty and visit you in prison if it gets bad enough. <laughs> you know? well, but it's a matter of choice. You don't have to pay your taxes, but there are consequences if you don't. You don't have to abide by the speed limits, but there are consequences if you go more than 35 miles an hour over. <laughs> uh, there, you know, but we get to choose. We get to choose. If we choose not to pay them, we make a choice. We get audited, fined, even in prison, possibly. Transitional sentence. Again, you're going from the introduction, and you're going to get into the body. Today, we want to look at several choices that were made in the Bible, and we will see what the result of those choices were. And so then the outline here went through and, and picked different historical accounts from the Bible Adam and Eve and the forbidden fruit. It was a choice. They could have said, no, we're not going to eat that fruit. But they made the wrong choice. Joseph and Potiphar's wife. He could have said, she's good looking. Yeah, but he didn't. He said, I won't sin against God. And he ran out. Choose life, Deuteronomy 30, 19 and 20. Whom will you serve? That was Joshua's question to the Israelites. You're going to serve the gods that were back in Egypt or the gods of the nation in whose land you dwell? But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. But it was a choice. Daniel and the king's food. What was the choice Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to make with the king's food? Yes, Tanner. Yeah, they weren't supposed to eat it, were they? It wasn't kosher food. It wasn't good for them. It wasn't what God wanted. Jesus would refuse evil and choose the good. Isaiah 7, 15 says, Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know how to refuse evil and choose the good. A prophecy about the coming of Christ. But you see, these are all choices that people had to make in the Old Testament. Again, this is a very, very broad outline. Uh, you could pull it into two or three characters on each of these. The rich young ruler made the wrong choice. Jesus offered him heaven, and he turned away sorrowful. Whew. But Jesus offers the world heaven today, and people, by and large, ignore it. So times haven't changed. What about Mary and Martha's choice? Martha, Martha, Martha was busy fixing the meal in the kitchen. I need Mary's help. She showed, made the better choice, Jesus says. Now, I don't know if Jesus and the crowd got invited back for another meal or not after that, but it was a choice. And our choice between which law we will obey first, God's law or man's law. And then the transitional sentence out, God's given us both freedom of choice and also the responsibility to make the right choice for him. When we make the wrong choice, we suffer the consequences. When we make the right choice, we receive God's blessing. Then the conclusion there, God has a choice for you to make concerning your relationship to his son, Jesus. You either choose Jesus, submit yourself to his will, or reject Jesus and do not submit to his will. You have that freedom of choice, but we also bear the consequences of the choice. 
and uh, get down into the invitation itself. You need to hear the gospel, believe in Jesus, Son of God, repent and turn from sin. Uh, perhaps you need to ask church uh, for the prayers in your behalf, but you get to make a choice. Stress the idea of choice. Thoughts or comments? Those are just general outlines, and as the lessons go on, I will have you filling in more parts to the sermon outlines uh, yourself, rather than me providing quite so much, but there will be 13 sermon outlines, and if you've looked ahead in the book, which is fine, you've looked ahead in the book, uh, you'll, you'll see that, you'll know that. Today we're going to talk about illustrations. Uh, last week we put some, or yeah, we just finished putting some flesh on an outline. Uh, again, you've got your style of presentation. Well, we want to look at illustrations. Walter Mondale and President Reagan were in a debate before the election, and Mr. Reagan was having a difficult time presenting his side of the argument. If you've read this, uh, you know where this is headed. But uh, the problem was not that he did not understand his point that he was trying to make. It's that his coworkers had said that he needed to change his style. Didn't work. Didn't work for him. His speech flopped. He didn't do well on that debate with Mr. Mondale. The point I'm trying to make is this. If each of us has our own personality, our own style that's going to come through someone we preach, so don't let anyone try to change that or it can ruin you as a speaker. If someone says, you know, you can't do it that way anymore, you may just have to quit. <laughs> Uh, if you're you know, if they absolutely won't let you use your style, it doesn't mean you cannot or should not try to make some slight modifications to your style because that's what this class is about. But you shouldn't be forced into a style of preaching that's not totally you. I was at a church one time where they tried to do that to me, and it drove me crazy. They didn't like my style, but that was before I realized every. Church has its own personality, just as every preacher has their own personality. And my personality and that church's personality did not go hand in hand at all. But we'd already moved there. <laughs> but just realize that if you can't use your own style in preaching, if I were to, to tell uh, Aaron tonight when he got up to speak, now, Aaron, you can't stand behind the microphone. You've got to walk up and down the aisle and have it all memorized. That's not your style. It's not your, but if I say, you have to do it that way, I'll guarantee your message is going to be pathetic and your hearers will be apathetic. They'll realize something is wrong. Something's just not right. And if you're not allowed to preach in what is basically your own style, find somewhere else to preach. <laughs> there are over 300 churches of Christ looking for preachers and youth ministers and college ministry uh, people. Lots of jobs out there. Uh, to not be allowed to use your own basic style of preaching in the pulpit is as bad as having to go in a boxing ring fighting Mike Tyson. When he was released from the boys' school in Indiana after having gotten thrown in prison there for a while, uh, I was at the police academy working and saw the circus over there as he came out of the boys' school. It was crazy. It was about a half mile, three quarter mile across a couple fields from the police academy where I was. And I asked, what's going on? And they told me, oh, Mike's getting let out over there. But how would you like to have to fight him 30 years ago? <laughs> I don't know what he's like now. But it'd be like trying to go into the ring. If they tell you, you can't preach that way. It's like going into the ring fighting Mike with one hand tied behind your back. You're in trouble. It's tough enough to present a good gospel sermon when you can use your own style. It's nearly impossible to present it when you're asked to use a style that is not your own. 
Even the young shepherd David could not use King Saul's armor to go out and fight Goliath because David hadn't proven or practiced in his armor. Heavy armor was not David's style of fighting, but a sling and a few stones and his shepherd staffs were. Oh, by the way, on the news, uh, the war over in the Mideast going on right now, did you see the Palestinians with their slings and their stones? They got, they got straps about this long on their slings, and boy, they can whip them around and whew. This is just as modern as the Old Testament scriptures. Those were the things, the sling and the stones were the things that David were comfortable with in fighting. We're fighting against the devil. We must be allowed free, our freedom to fight through our own style of presentation of the gospel, but don't go overboard wanting to roll on the floor or swing from the rafters or hang from the ceiling fans to preach. The blades will bend and you'll fall. Some preachers gesture a lot, and that's okay. Some move around, even walk up and down the aisle part way. Others just stand behind the pulpit, but whatever your basic style is, use it. Also use inflection in your voice. Few people can listen to monotone very long. Put some inflection in your voice. Get excited. Had one fellow that uh, took the preaching class and he says, how, how do you like my preaching? I said, you're preaching like a college professor would give a speech to the class. And he goes, huh? I said, show some enthusiasm. Show some excitement. He changed and he became a much better preacher. I don't know what he did. He wasn't in the classroom anymore, I don't think. But a much better, he was much better speaker after showing some enthusiasm. If you're not excited about it, no one else is going to be excited either. And so you've got to carry some enthusiasm. Remember, most people's minds cannot comprehend more than their sitting muscles can endure. As one preacher's wife said, just remember the word kiss. And of course, he was great. Thought that was great. Of course, it put a smile on his face, but she reminded him later, it's an acrostic for keep it short and simple. Keep it short and simple. It doesn't have to be hours long. No one ever complained because the sermon was a few minutes too short. And keep it simple enough for the average person of the few to understand. If a sixth grader can't understand it, you may need to rework it. Unless you are, you know you're in front of a group where everybody's got their master's or doctorate degree, keep it simple. They've got kids in the crowd. They need to be able to pick up on some things. Case in point, you might be interested in John's epistemology or Jesus' eschatology, but use simpler words to get let the people know you're going to talk about the writings of the Apostle John or Jesus' teaching on things that have to happen before the uh, end of time in the last days. You know, you throw out a big word every once in a while just so they know you're educated <laughs> in it, that you've done your reading, that you know what you're talking about. But for the most part, keep it simple. Keep it simple. To help an outline flow, you might want to include a few lines from a poem, a prose, even a few words from a familiar song. I have in the past used uh, choruses from some uh, hymns that people know. You can involve logic. Uh, I've used the outline or the idea wise men still seek him dealing with Christmas time and the wise men. Uh, it's okay to use some quips and quotes, but use the gospel message first. That's got to be your main message. Uh, a fellow by the name of Ray Walker. Any of you know the name? He was actually part of the backup group for Elvis Presley. For a while. Anyway, he was a member of the Church of Christ. He held a, uh, a, a sing fest, I guess you'd call it, for our congregation when we were in Indiana. And he had he, he was in charge of the sermon, and the whole sermon was nothing but hymns. Nothing but hymns, but the hymns talked about God's love, Christ's sacrifice, man's sin, God's offer of redemption, and then he ended it with an invitation song, took up the half hour. Uh, great. It, it was different. 
It was different, but it had everything in there. And of course, he'd make a few comments between the songs. But uh, you can use a rule of thumb, three points in a poem. Uh, I notice even Matthew talks about that a little bit too. Make a sermon outline, it's a bare skeleton, but hey, it'll get you there. Perhaps you could use a famous painting, religious painting, a religious topic. Uh, this goes to Jacob's question about where do you get an idea? Uh, you, you can use a famous religious painting or topic for a sermon, such as the Last Supper, uh, painted by da Vinci. Jesus' picture is supposed to be one of the first ones painted in the picture. The artist tried to find a real human face to portray what he thought Jesus might look like. The man used for Jesus' face had a good life, happy, friendly. Many months went by, painted Judas last, and needed someone that was sullen and downcast and uh, looked evil and had maybe become evil, and they used the same guy because he supposedly had turned bad. And after I had printed this, material 20 years ago i found out that's probably an urban legend but it makes a great story so just realize that some of the things you're going to see on the internet aren't necessarily true but sometimes they do make a good story uh, illustration to put in how many of you recognize this picture Turn in your Bibles. I want someone to read Revelation 3.20. This, I don't know who, who did the picture, but it is a very... Back in the 50s and 60s, everybody that was religious had a picture like this hanging on their wall. Revelation 3.20. If you find it, read it. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to let him eat with him and he with me. I'll let you see up close. That's Jesus standing at the door, knocking. But there's something, there's something missing. You saw it. Yeah, I showed this, I showed this five years ago. There's something missing in the picture. There's no, there's no handle on the door. There's no handle on the door. It's just an artist's conception. But there's no, you know, the, the doors back then had little ropes and you could pull the rope, and, and, but there's no, there's no handle of any kind. No handle of any kind on the door. And so Jesus is standing out there knocking. Great illustration. He's knocking. Got to be open from the inside. Has to be opened uh, from the inside. There are object lesson sermons based on some object that gets a point across. Some of the Old Testament prophets were famous for their object lessons. And in the New Testament, Agabus tied his hands, tied Paul's hands, with ties uh, with uh, Paul's own belt around his hands and said, if Paul goes to Jerusalem, this is what he's gonna gonna happen to him. And so he he we had a had a, a deacon in, in uh, Des Moines that he he did a sermon in a sack, uh, and he'd get up to the pulpit and, and he'd you never knew what he was gonna reach out of the sack, but but whatever it was, it was an object lesson sermon to get your mind thinking. And so you know if you're gonna talk a, a, about Samson, you could have a pair of barber clippers. If, if you're going to talk uh, about uh, Jonah and the, the whale, you might you know, have a, a goldfish in a jar. Uh, it, you know, find something that you can relate to. If you go that direction, I'm trying to give you some suggestions, Jacob, uh, wh where you get ideas from. Don't overdo them. Once you get into the habit of making good orderly outlines, they'll become easier to do and will actually become almost routine after you do them often enough. You'll probably soon settle on a certain style of putting your sermon together and preaching it, style of outlining, style of preaching. So how many sermon outlines, sermon illustrations, or sermon starters did you find in this lesson in your book? If you didn't find any, 
and you haven't been paying attention in class. If you didn't found three or less, you're learning, but need to try to concentrate more on what's happening. And if you found four or more, you are really on your way to having an easier time finding sermon topics and illustrations. How many did you find if you looked? There are 10. President Reagan in his debate with Mondale, fighting Mike Tyson, David and Goliath with Saul's armor, Kiss, keep it short and simple, wise men still seek him. Number four on this page, dealing with the songs, is a four or five point sermon outline skeleton. Talked about the Last Supper, talked about Jesus, the picture of Jesus knocking at the door, talked about Agabus with the belt that Paul had, and the barber's clipper from Samson and Delilah. I threw in Jonah and a goldfish. What I want you to see is that you've got to be looking for illustrations and sermon ideas. Now, uh, let me throw out a caveat. <laughs> Once you start doing that, it is really hard to stop. Even if you don't do much preaching or aren't, aren't teaching for a quarter or whatever, if you get really to where you're focused in on, I've got to have, when I was preaching, I had to have five different things come off my typewriter every week. Sunday morning Bible class, Sunday morning sermon, Sunday night sermon, bulletin article, and Wednesday night sermon or class. And with that much stuff that had to be done every week, I got into the routine. If anything caught my attention at all, I wrote it down or cut it out and made a copy of it somewhere. You need to do that because you never know when you're going to be called upon to speak in a class or to, to give a sermon. Any thoughts? Some of you are already given sermons. We won't compare them with the notes we had tonight. Oh, you made mention tonight about teaching versus preaching, and I can tell you it's, it's very, very much different. And, and <laughs> I find myself sometimes wanting to teach when I'm preaching, and uh, I have to go the other way. <laughs> have to go the other way. <laughs> well, next week we're going to finish part four, lesson four here, uh, but two different ways of outlining the same verses of scripture, not doing injustice to it at all, just two different angles you're looking at it from and uh, giving a, a, a view from different things. And yes, uh, there is a difference between preaching and teaching. All right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll wrap up. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity to study a little bit more how to be better preachers and teachers. Help us, Father, that we might be better servants of yours. Thank you for each one that's here. Thank you for those that are on the internet. We just ask, Father, that you bless us and bless the work of the church here in Iowa. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you.